Hello everybody and thanks for watching. Welcome to episode 79 of If This Car Could Talk. Today we're bringing you the brief history of a performance car built by the now defunct Mercury division of Ford Motor Company. You'll remember that last Sunday we featured an absolutely mint 2003 model. If you missed it, you really need to go back and find it. To ensure you never miss any of our videos, please subscribe if you haven't already done so. It's free and it's easy. Be sure to like and share the video and leave a comment. We always appreciate hearing from you guys. The car is really a time capsule, clocking just a shade over 15,000 miles. So without further ado, let's go for a ride. The performance sedan, which had been gaining popularity because of offerings from Europe and Japan, was not really a thing in the United States among traditional car enthusiasts until Chevrolet debuted its Impala SS four-door sedan in 1994. It featured a revised suspension and four-wheel disc brakes, a Corvette-based engine and transmission, dual exhaust, special wheels, and unique exterior badging and interior features, along with other amenities previously found only on police-packaged Caprices. Built at GM's Arlington, Texas facility, production spanned 34 months, from February of 1994 until December of 1996. In that time, 69,768 Impala SS models were assembled. It is often incorrectly stated that the Mercury Marauder, a member of the fourth generation of the Grand Marquis Panther platform, was Ford's response to the Impala SS. This could not be farther from the truth. By the time the car debuted in 2003, the Impala SS had been out of production for seven model years. In truth, the Marauder was developed by Ford to be their flagship performance sedan, as most manufacturers had a flagship sedan of some kind at the time. Also, the writing was on the wall for Mercury's demise, so this was essentially a last ditch effort to bolster the brand to younger customers. In 2003, the average Grand Marquis buyer was 69 years old. The Marauder's demographic was 51 years old. Unfortunately, it would prove to be a futile attempt at saving a brand that had been a rebadged Ford for many years. But how was the final Marauder developed? Well, that's a very interesting story. Let's go all the way back to 1958, where Mercury's marketing department first assigned this rebellious sounding name to a new line of engines based on what was then the Mercury Edsel Lincoln series, displacing 368, 383, 410, 430, and in 1966, 462 cubic inches. The name faded into oblivion once Ford developed their FE series of engines. 332, 352, 361, 390, 406, 427, and 428 engines. There are other sizes of the FE, but they were used in trucks only and are not germane to the topic at hand. These engines were perfectly positioned to compete in the factory horsepower wars that were developed in the early 1960s. The first Marauder that was actually a car and not an engine option arrived in dealer showrooms in mid-1963. At the time, any full-size Mercury 2 or 4-door hardtop was designated a Marauder within its series of Monterey, Montclair, or Park Lane. This was also true for the next two years. At the time, a Marauder model could be a mundane means of transportation or it could be a badass muscle car with up to 427 cubic inches under the hood. 
it was merely a cosmetic package. Ford reverted to again calling the performance engines Marauder and Super Marauder, depending on the year and horsepower rating. 1966 would not see a car with this designation, but the new for 66 428 cubic inch engine would be dubbed thusly. The name took a complete hiatus for two years from both automobiles and engines, when in 1969 was now its own model. Buyers could upgrade to a Marauder X100, which had unique Kelsey Hayes aluminum wheels, a 429 Thunderjet engine, leather interior, and a distinctive matte black paint scheme on the deck lid and up around the back window. A slightly restyled version was available the following year. Ford wisely kept the trademark name, knowing that they may one day again use this identity on a high-profile automobile. That opportunity waited for 33 years, when it was finally used for the last time on what I think is the best Marauder yet. In 2003, Ford engineers developed a stiffer Panther frame, which increased wheelbase slightly from 114.3 inches to 114.7 inches. Along with updated suspension for their best-selling Grand Marquis, as well as their Ford Crown Victoria police and taxi cars, and the luxurious Lincoln Town Car, they were the best yet. Brakes were also improved, but the big news was the steering system. It was now the more precise rack and pinion design. The standard 4.6 liter single overhead cam engine competently powered all the Panther platformed offerings except the Marauder. In 1998, Ford built a concept car for the SEMA show which featured a Grand Marquis model with a 335 horsepower supercharged 4.6 single overhead cam. It was called Marauder. The car received rave reviews and Ford started engineering a new model to fit the parameters set and then debuted at the 2001 Chicago Auto Show. They also did a two-door convertible. This would essentially be the Marauder as we now know it. The engines were taken right off the assembly line for the Mustang Cobras, displacing 4.6 liters or 281 cubic inches, but these were of the dual overhead cam design. They were rated at 302 horsepower at 5750 RPMs, and the Cobra was 305 horsepower. The difference was the exhaust system. The Marauder system was tuned for sound and included the distinctive Meg tips. They all used a 4R70W 4-speed automatic transmission with a 2400 stall converter, spinning an aluminum drive shaft back to the 355 geared limited slip 8.8 .8 differential. Putting all the power to the ground was a beautiful set of Alcoa supplied 18-inch polished aluminum wheels mounting performance tires. The rears were slightly wider by 10 millimeters. Today there are many bolt-on performance enhancing parts available and most of these cars have been modified to some degree. In the long run, I believe the unmodified cars will be the ones that collectors really want. Where the Marauder really stood out was all the exterior styling cues. All cars were initially black and featured a monochrome look. They had their own front and rear bumper covers. Tail lamps came from the Crown Vic parts bin because they had no chrome. All had fog lamps positioned on the front bumper's lower extreme outside corners. It was also quite retro for stylists to strategically place the Mercury Gods profile on the wheel center caps and on the front seat backs. This symbol was last used in 1969 on some wheel center caps. The grille, deck lid, and steering wheel used the era appropriate flying M or waterfall ornamentation found on all other Grand Marquis models. Inside, Marauders were equipped with leather front seats and a traditional leather rear seat. The buckets were similar to the 2002-6 Ford Crown Victoria Sport or the Mercury Grand Marquis LSE, built from 2001-4 and then again from 2006-8. There were a few slight differences. The consoles were Marauder only because these cars had tachometers, displacing the oil pressure and volt gauges. They were relocated to the console and were supplied by Autometer. What was the wood grain plastic dash and door trim in the standard Grand Marquis now appeared as brushed aluminum on these very special cars. 
Because they were so well equipped, the only options were a six disc CD changer, which was trunk mounted, a trunk organizer, and a rear spoiler. The last two were dealer installed. Other niceties included a leather bomber style jacket that was embossed with Marauder, included at no charge to every original purchaser. The embroidered floor mats were also standard are an extremely hard to find option today. As mentioned, the first cars available to eager dealers were all black. Soon complaints reached Ford that customers living in the southern United States would not buy one. They were simply too hot during the summer months. Ford made Silver Birch an option late in the year with only 417 ordered. Rarer yet were the 328 dark blue pearl examples also offered later in the year. Despite the complaints, 7,093 black cars were sold. The first cars are now known among collectors as 300A because they had features not seen in later production. All had clocks and front bucket seat map pockets. This is the most obvious visual clue. They also had an auto-release fuel door and emergency brake. Under hood, all 300 A's had hood lamps and black valve covers. All had charcoal interiors. In the trunk, the spare tire was full size. Windshields were tinted at the top. Exact numbers of the 300 A is unknown, but it's probably at least 6,000 units. Incidentally, this alphanumeric designation was the internal dealer ordering code for a Marauder. The next series of late 2003 and all 2004 cars are known to collectors as 300B models. They all featured a manual release fuel door and emergency brake. Under hood, no light was found and the valve covers were now aluminum. The seats were now heated and a mini spare resided in the trunk. All windshields had a dot matrix pattern on the uppermost portion. It's been documented that many cars have features of both series, as many of these things were running production changes. The 300Bs also had the light flint interior motif available. The production numbers shown include both. Total 2003 production totaled 7,838, which is pretty dismal since Ford research showed a much bigger demand. They had a capacity at the St. Thomas, Ontario, Canada plant to build up to 18,000 cars per year. At first glance, the novice Marauder enthusiast may think the cars are similar from 03 to 04. However, there are many differences. In 2004, black was still the most popular color, with 1,237 cars sold. The dark blue pearl was discontinued, replaced by dark Toreador red. This color accounted for 980 units sold. The Silver Birch sold an additional 997 cars and 2004 production ended at 3,214 units. Total for both years was 11,052. Interiors were still available in charcoal or flint as in the previous year. Other notable differences between the two years are that the 04 had a sunroof moonroof option since the Panther cars were now able to pass DOT required rollover tests that year. 2004 also had dual knock sensors and a new transmission, the 4R75W with a 2700 stall speed converter. Finally, the audio systems were improved. The option list remained short. These cars were sold new for around $35,000. I don't think that consumer awareness was the reason they didn't sell well. Ford had a lot of different promotional print items being distributed as mailers or in showrooms. Most magazines of the day did road reports and all were favorable. Online sources such as Edmunds also liked the cars in their write-ups. At the end of the day, I don't think most potential buyers saw the value in that sticker price, especially considering other cars available at the time. To obtain a copy of your vehicle's build sheet, window sticker and equipment list, go to www.martyauto.com. Kevin Marty has all available data on Ford Motor Company products from 1967 to 2017. There are also two very active internet sites. Finding original and dealer showroom literature is easy 
thanks to eBay and the two clubs online. I think this type of thing elevates nice cars to a higher level and having things like the jacket help as well. Window stickers were designed to be removed intact and finding an original with a car is a nice bonus. Well, now you're a Marauder expert. Congratulations. Please tell us in the comments which color you like best. See you next Sunday where we'll bring you an accurate replica of Marty McFly's Toyota SR5 truck from Back to the Future. If you're a fan of the movie or of these trucks, you won't want to miss it. Thanks for watching and remember, be careful out there.